Chapter 6 The Fight The Pony Pals rode their ponies. ponies with a kind of solemnity usually reserved for soldiers en route to battle. The cat weighed heavily in all their minds. Acorn was afraid of it. Pam felt a burning hatred towards it. Anna secretly hoped that it could answer her questions about what had happened to her in that twenty minutes during which she had been dead. Pawnee wanted to learn new cocktail recipes from it. She had a serious problem. Where should we start looking for the cat? Pam asked, munching on the pheasant that she had just plucked from the sky mid-flight. Acorn was staring in the direction of Pony Pal Trail, said Anna. Somehow still unaware of how fucking stupid Pony Pal Trail sounds. Let's start there. Pawnee extravasated. It could be a clue. The Pony Pals galloped across the field. They, they turned down the three magic beans that a mysterious man standing in a field offered them in exchange for their immortal souls. It was probably a wise decision. Look for local politicians it's in the snow, said Pawnee, secretly hoping to find her mother and settle the question of her true paternity once and for all. Anna and Acorn took the lead. Anna looked straight, straight but she was actually bisexual. Pawnee knew that the anti-regulatory libertarian Ron Swanson politically leaned to the right, and Pam, as she was known to do, left inflammatory manifestos nailed to every tree she passed. After a while, Pam barbarically yawped. I see some bullshit over here to advance the plot. Anna turned Acorn around and looked to where Pam pointed. Small tracks in the snow crackled with intense violet magics. To Anna, they looked like the marks she had seen in her dreams last night. Her robot fist clenched. Pawnee d dismounted to get a closer look at the tracks. She pulled out her PKE meter. Its readings were off the charts. This adventure had gone off the rails. Pawnee was off the wagon. These are very fiendish tracks, the town said, but they have eldritch runes. A cat's track is so goddamn evil that no runes can bind its strength. A leopard made these tracks. Fleet and nimble-footed, with coat completely covered by dark spots. And those tracks over there are of a lion, head held high and furious for hunger, so that the air itself seems to be shaking. And those tracks are from a she-wolf, ravenously lean, seemingly laden with such endless cravings that she had made many live in misery. By nature, she is so depraved and vicious that her greedy appetite is never filled. The more she feeds, the hungrier she grows. Pawnee swung back up on little Sebastian. But there shall be no greyhound, born between Feltro and Feltro, she said. Only another fucking cat. Anna took the lead again. When they reached the three birches, Acorn stopped. He knew that it was his time to leave, and, surprisingly, he realized that he was ready to. He glanced down. Page 43, Acorn thought to himself. A prime number. Is it fitting or ironic that a life full of multiplicity end with something indivisible? It's just as the ancient prophecy foretold, said Anna excitedly. Where the three birches rise up, there shall he descend, said Pam. You know Acorn. It was not long for this world, Anna. We were wrong about the cat. He's not here for us. He's still a son of a fuck, but we can't interfere with this. There could be a clue, Pawnee burbled. Let's see what really happens beyond the veil, on the other side of the other side. Acorn sniffed for another minute, then he raised his head. He turned toward a trail that started behind the three birch trees. Mino sat in the upper branches of one of the trees, shitting silently and solemnly onto the forest floor below. Acorn needs to leave with his feline psychopomp, Anna. We all knew that his reckoning would come one day, Pawnee said quietly. I'm sorry. Anna nodded sadly. All three girls dismounted in silence. Anna closed her eyes and dropped Acorn's reins. The cat began to come down from its perch, hopping from branch to branch, leaving a tiny kitty shit on each. It landed lightly in the snow and began to saunter towards Acorn, but Anna stepped into its path. She knelt and looked the cat right in its goddamn eyes. You are an evil fucking thing, Anna whispered. I now understand who you are and what you must do, but I swear I will never, never forgive you. I warn you, judge fairly, for even the eternal judge is not free from my judgment. Yes, I too have a secret. There are wheels within wheels in the town of Wiggins and fires within fires. Now go, she stood. The cat sauntered between her legs and jumped onto Acorn's back. Minos rode Acorn down the long and winding path into the unknown. 
Now, at the end of Acorn's lifelong journey, he found himself deep in a silent wood, the slate gray sky foreboding, dense and stormy. An evil fucking cat kept scheming brood upon his back, a burden unremitting. As Acorn cantered on, he understood their destination would be one befitting an unrepentant sinner such as he. But then the cat of darkness started shitting. And now it seemed that every shrub and tree was naught but cat shit sown in shitty earth, a shitty island in a shitty sea. The cat shit on and laughed with gleeful mirth at Acorn's clear disgust at such a sight. And now, like an inverted fecal birth, they neared the source of this unholy blight, a guano gate upon which words appeared in script that burned red with fiery light. Abandon all hope, ye who enter here. Derivative, said Acorn, and cliché. I'd say Dantesque, the cat replied, but we are not in this place to sightsee. Acorn neighed, the suffix esque implies a likeness, not a phrase that's stolen wholesale which conveys the writer's laziness, like they forgot illusion must be more than blatant theft. Caught up in meta-referential thoughts, the pony failed to notice they had left the realm of life and entered that of death. Of light and joy, of love and mirth bereft, this cloudy and adumbral land impressed upon its visitor an eerie calm, as if some cosmic power held its breath. In Gilead there's not a drop of balm, nor respite, nor nepenthe to be found, the shepherd's absent from King David's psalm. For in the river Enon he was drowned. Towards other rivers now sped Acorn on, which through this murky landscape curled and wound. Cockatus, Lethe, Styx, and Phlegathon. Twas Acheron, though, they now drew near, and Acorn knew he'd seen his final dawn. Grim Charon waited at his marshy pier, but Acorn whinnied, fuck that noise, and leapt into the waters, biting back his fear. Against the rotting waves the pony schlepped, amidst a thousand thousand slimy souls that howled or gnashed their teeth or prayed or wept. The river's morbid current sucked and pulled, but our determined acorn stayed in stride. His iron hooves struck out and beat the cold and damned spirits right between their eyes. The wraiths shrank back, and in their swirling blood, as black as sin, was acorn rebaptized. At last his hooves did touch the fetid mud of that dread river's other darker bank, where blew a constant miasmatic scud of misery from which all pure souls shrank. The pony plodded onward towards his fate, the wretched water dripping from his flanks. It seemed that nothing now could break his gait, that from his course he never could be budged, despite his rider's grim, oppressive weight. The steadfast acorn merely onward trudged, prepared to have his heavy sins be judged. You can stop here, acorn, said the cat. What part of Hades' lair is this that you have brought me to? You No, we're done with the Terzarima now. You don't have to talk in iambics anymore. That's a relief, said Acorn, relishing the dactyl. Acorn glanced around at their stopping place. The slimy banks of the Acheron had long since transitioned into a forest of dead white trees, through which the pony and the cat had been walking for what felt like either minutes, hours, or decades. But now Acorn and the goddamned cat stood in a small clearing filled with cold, flat light that filtered down from some unseen source in the uniformly cloud-covered sky. The ground beneath Acorn's hooves was gray and marshy and seemed somehow ephemeral, as if it was not entirely there, as if there was something else just below its surface, nearly visible. An oppressive mist hung in the sky and over the ground, sending cold tendrils to lick at Acorn's fetlocks. Silence. Stillness. So is this where it happens? Acorn asked. This is where I'm judged by you? Well, by me and my two co-arbiters, Mino said, as he leapt off Acorn's back and sashayed to a broad, low tree stump near the middle of the clearing. He jumped onto the white stump, sat, and curled his tail around himself demurely. Yes, said Acorn. You are referring to your brother Radamanthus and Aeacus, the former king of Aegina. The three of you judge the souls of the dead and decide which realm of the underworld they shall inhabit. Right, exactly, said the cat. You didn't have to explain all that to me, since I obviously know it already. I know, said Acorn. But this part of the plot's important, and I wanted to make it all explicit for people who don't know every fucking detail of Greek mythology by heart. Fine, whatever. The point is, Acorn, the other judges will be joining us shortly, and then your soul shall be laid bare, for I have known your sins already, known them all, the sins that fixed you in that formulated phrase, and when you are formulated, sprawling on a pin, when you are pinned and wriggling on my wall, then how will you begin to spit out all the butt-ends of your days and ways? And how should you presume? Acorn shot back. Minos shook his tiny cat head. 
Acorn, that is not what you meant at all. That is not it at all. The cat began licking one adorable white paw and glanced slyly at the defiant pony from the corners of his bottomless eyes. So tell me, has it been worth it after all? Has it been worthwhile? I think we should go back, said Pam. It's the safe thing to do. Acorn has gone to be judged for his sins and that god-awful cat left with him. I agree with Pam, Pam said Pawnee. She put, put the severed head of the rapper Snoop Dogg back into her saddlebag. We should go back. To Wiggins, even though that's still a dumb name for a town. I thought the Pony Pals didn't give up, said Anna. Sparks began to fly from her mechanical arm, and the other Pony Pals heard a horrifying grinding. Whether from the arm or from the tortured swarm of brain gears inside Anna's head, they were unsure. We're not giving up, said Pawnee. We just don't think that we can rescue Acorn's soul now that it has been reaped by that fucking cat. Anna, it's two against one, said Pam. And proudly. She had only recently learned to count and showed off this new skill at every opportunity. Anna was conflicted. She knew that Pawnee was right. Acorn's soul was irredeemable and now irretrievable. She also knew the true nature of that fiend posing as a cat. There could be no revenge taken on such a creature, and if she provoked it, it might well come back to the plane of the mortals and keep fucking with the pony pals out of pure spite. Finally, Anna knew that if she went into the underworld, she would never be able to return to this realm. She had been yanked back from death once, and now the other side had a magnetic pull on her soul, trying to drag it back to where it rightfully should be. Her next death, she knew, would be final. But Anna fucking loved Acorn. Then you two can go back, said Anna angrily. I'm going to go into that good night, and I'm sure as fuck not going gentle. She put out her hand, beckoning for the only two friends she had left in this world to come with her. Burn and rave with me, she whispered. Catch and sing the sun in flight. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Both acorns and your own. You can't go fucking Orpheus on our asses now, yelled Pawnee. She had only recently learned basic Greek mythology and showed off this new knowledge at every opportunity. Anna put her hands on her hips. Oh, yes, I can, she told them. You can't make me go back. Well, looks like somebody's being a sassy Susan, Pam said. Look, we want to try to destroy that fucking cat, too, but if we follow Acorn, there's no guarantee that any of us will come back, least of all Acorn. It's his time, Anna, Pawnee said. She touched Anna's hand gently and couldn't help but shudder at the unnatural coldness. She grew more concerned when she realized that Anna's metal hand hadn't been the one she touched. She pulled out her emergency margarita kit and fixed herself a strong one. Anna was undeterred. I'm saving Acorn's life, goddammit, even if it means sacrificing my own. She glared at her two friends. If you wouldn't do the same for your pony, then you don't fucking deserve to be called a pony pal. She spat in the snow at her feet. Pawnee could have sworn that she saw the saliva glow slightly. Was it radiation from the uranium-powered arm? Ectoplasm, left over from Anna's brush with death? The light of pure burning rage and love? Or was Pawnee just sloshed? Anna turned her back on her friends both literally and metaphorically and began to walk away. Away from all that she had ever known, and towards that which could not be known. Detective Pony was originally written by Gene Betancourt. The first two pages were altered by Andrew Hussey, pretending to be Dirk Strider. The rest of the pages were altered by Sonnet Stuck, also pretending to be Dirk Strider. The book is read by Duckface as yet another person pretending to be Dirk Strider, and Naked Bee as Gene Betancourt, a fourth character who may or may not be Dirk Strider. This recording was instigated, perpetrated, and assembled by Naked Bee. Eh, I should probably do that correctly. Hang on. Oh, uh, no, no. How do you pronounce that? Hang on a sec. Okay, let's take another crack at that. <clears throat>